Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Roll Call. Uh, my name is Kayla McNabb. I use she, her pronouns, and I will be your host this evening. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, Winnie the Pooh one-shot that uh, we ran uh, back in December of 2020. If you'd like to see the VOD of that playthrough, it is on our YouTube channel, and you can find that link in uh, the About section of our Twitch profile. Um, this is a follow-up that we'll be recording after every play session, uh, usually in the future, about two weeks after. Uh, so if you have questions for our panelists this evening or after future sessions, definitely feel free to put those in the chat or to send those to us uh, with the hashtag VTUL roll call. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that and compiling questions if we have any from viewers. Uh, so we're going to learn a little bit more about the work of literature, the characters, and uh, potentially the game itself. This was our first Honey Heist. Uh, and if you have questions, remember to put those in the chat. We are keeping an eye on that. Um, I'll start by having uh, everyone remind us uh, who they are and who they played in our session. Um, so let's see here. Let's start with, we'll start with Kira because she is top left on the cycle. On your yeah. screen. Uh, my name is Kira Dietz. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the assistant director of Special Collections and University Archives. Uh, and I was the GM for this game of Honey Heist, which is a fun RPG that I love to run. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Reese? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Brees. Uh, I use they, them pronouns, and I am a grad student. I'm a second year master's student in the English department. And I was a player in this game. Awesome. Thank you. Alex. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Kinnaman. I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm the digital preservation coordinator at University Libraries. And I was also a player in this game. Excellent. Uh, and we did have two other uh, bears. Mm, not, not bears. bears. Uh, we Actually, not a lot <laughs> of bears. I was the only bear. <laughs> <Funny heist. laughs> well, we have the bear. bear. <laughs> so since this is a little bit different than the other sessions that we've had, or most of the other sessions that we've had of Roll Call, Gear, would you tell us a little bit about Honey Heist? and how that's different than Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Yeah, so Honey Heist is an RPG in which, generally speaking, and our game was a little bit different, we can definitely get into that, uh, your players play a set of bears with potentially criminal tendencies who are attempting to steal some honey uh, from someone or something. Uh, so basically it's a D6 system. Our, our players only had to roll D6s, when they did something that uh, they all had a, a bear type that gave them an extra skill, they all had a role in the game. Um, so if they did something, that's R-O-L-E, not R-O-L-L, -L, although it was a little <laughs> bit of both. Um, and so if they were trying to do something that was bear related or related to the skill they had, they're asked to basically roll for bear and they could succeed or fail on that. Uh, or if they were doing something that was a little more criminal, they would be asked to roll for criminal and they would again sort of succeed or fail on that. And when you succeed on something, your plan goes off without a hitch, you get a little greedy, and you move numbers uh, into your criminal points. And if you fail, you get a little frustrated, you move points into your bear uh, stats, so you basically only have two stats in this game. And players uh, ideally do not want to go fully bear with your six points or fully criminal, because that basically ends the game, something awful happens, <laughs> and you don't get away with your honey. There you go. So it is... Uh simpler in a lot of ways than 5e and really lends itself to uh fun times a uh, lot of flexibility yeah, a lot of chaos in that game for sure for <laughs> sure awesome thank you so with that kind of in mind uh i'd like to start if there are any questions um that any of you have for each other or for the game master um, if there's anything either from playing in the game or kind of in reflecting on your time in the Hundred Acre Woods, questions that you have for um, for each other or for Kira. It's also okay if the answer is no. <laughs> I guess I'm curious, Kira. I mean, n 
no GM really no or every GM knows better than to expect anything out of a game. But that said, <laughs> did did the game go how you expected it to? Or did we just completely go off the rails? I'm always curious about how the reality defies what the GM had planned. So I definitely this is not the first time I've run Honey Heist. And, and as I mentioned earlier, Honey Heist is a game that lends itself to going off the rails very quickly. So I would say my expectations were pretty low. Like my, my goal, my hope is always that um, the bears are going to get away with their honey. Um, but this game was a little bit different in the way that I structured it and some of the context and the, the outcomes that I was hoping for just because of the nature of the work and um, the nature of children's literature. So um, I think it worked out the way I was hoping and potentially the way I was expecting. But I mean, I had contingencies for a lot of things and I wasn't sure like, and we had had like a couple, we had had a session zero. So we had all had some conversations about, you know, your characters and what you all, um, how you were going to know each other and some things like that. So I didn't really adjust my plan based on that, but I thought it could lead to some very interesting things. Um, and in some ways it definitely did, but I would say on the whole, it, it like generally overarchingly went the way I expected. <laughs> So kind of, it kind of worked. <laughs> yeah, it kind of did. I mean, you all ended up with the outcome I was hoping for and that I wanted to expect, but so that's, that I consider a success. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely so, hard to know. <laughs> yeah. So I did have a question. Um, I knew that Heffalumps and Woozles would appear as possible antagonists because that just makes sense in, in the storyline. But did you choose um, the like variations of like where we might end up, and like the decisions we make, and where the, the different paths were those taken from any specific stories, or did, is it completely original story just set with the characters and the like location? So I took uh, I started basically with a map of the Hundred Acre Woods as my like sort of framework and starting point and thinking about where all of the characters in the stories lived as a result of that and that was like so i dropped you in a very specific place giving you some very specific options um and then uh there were a bunch so i was working primarily from the first collection of short stories the second one is uh the first one i can't remember what it's called at the moment um but i have notes about it but um the second collection oh it's just winnie the pooh was the first collection so that's what i was working from was the first collection there is a second collection the house at pooh corner and the only thing i pulled from there was the potential for an appearance of tigger um <laughs> which didn't really come to fruition but that's okay um so i took uh a couple of i pulled from a bunch of different stories like the north pole like the fact that you met the heffalumps and whistles past the north pole finding the north pole is one of the short stories you know they go to discover the north pole and then they actually create slash discover the North Pole. <laughs> um, so I thought, what happens if you go beyond the North Pole? And that was where you encountered, you know, the dark woods that you found with the heffalumps and woozles in their criminal-esque shack <laughs> in the woods. <laughs> um, uh, the whole story about the honey, the, the tree that grows from a honeycomb is an element from one of the stories. And I just took that a few extra steps. Like, what if it did grow into this tree? What if this tree became sad and corrupted? How would a group of maybe criminal, but maybe not so criminal animals go about fixing that and bringing some sort of happiness back to the woods and still get what they want out of it? Um so it was kind of just taking elements that I liked from different stories and uh, and also just knowing the characters because I've always loved these stories and being able to pretend to be them was a lot of, like and how they would enact how they would interact with with animals from outside their woods was kind of just that was what I started with and just sort of ran with. <laughs> awesome. With that, would you mind telling us a little bit more about kind of the work itself and kind of the context that uh, the series of short stories or two collections of short stories were kind of created in? Yeah. 
So I know a lot of people maybe read these as a kid or had them read to them. If you've never encountered the stories, chances are you've encountered pop culture versions in the Disney cartoons or the Disney film or a lot of other things. Um, but the original stories were written by A.A. A. Milne for his son, Christopher Robin, who is, in fact, also a character in the stories, who you did not encounter because I did not want to bring any people. There was a possibility for that, too, should the need arise. Um, but he originally wrote this collection of stories in 1926 for Christopher Robin. Um, and then in 1928, the second set of books, The House of Pooh Corner, which is, you know, like I said, includes Where You Meet Tigger. Um, there also are a bunch of individual poems that Milne published in other places um, that sort of give us this cast of characters that I think are very sort of iconic and um, archetypes of their own, and they sort of represent different aspects of it. So, um, and then there are characters that show up later. So actually Disney added the gopher character because at one point somebody said, is the gopher going to be in there? And I actually chose not to include the gopher because it was not part of the original sort of lore of Winnie the Pooh. Um, so yeah, and I think what I was trying to do was, you know, all these characters are archetypes. Um, you know, things are, it, we're in a pandemic. It's not exactly a happy world, but I thought, how can I take these stories that have these like, good messages these happy messages in the end about friendship and family and community um and try and put that into the adventure that we were having which would still be hilarious and fun because i had no idea what the players were gonna do <laughs> yeah and that um that kind of that context and when we played or when you all played that game you talked a little bit about your previous experience with the work uh and i wonder if if anyone feels like after kind of going through playing that session, if that previous experience impacted how you responded or kind of how you think about the way that the session went. Things like wondering if Gopher's going to be there because you have that, you know, when we envision the 100 Acre Wood, I know in my head it looks like the Disney version. Um, you know, how did those other experiences with adaptations and media impact the way that you approach the game. I mean, so, it definitely uh, made me excited to see certain characters or hope to see certain characters because I was familiar with them. Uh, like, you know, seeing Eeyore at the very beginning was exciting because it was the first one we ran into. So it's like, yes, awesome. We get to talk to Eeyore. And then I stole his tail because, you know, what else does a thieving fox do? Um, but yeah, so being excited to see certain characters or wanting to see other characters, I think was probably the biggest thing. And like you just said, having an idea in your head of what it looks like, you know, envisioned through whatever media you've seen. Like I watched the cartoons when I was little, so that probably had the biggest uh, impact on the way I visualized it. I'd agree with that. I, uh, I remember reading the books as a child, because I know we had at least a handful from the first collection, uh, but largely I think of the short films <clears throat> and the show. Yeah. Um, but I, <laughs> I'd forgotten what Woozles looked like. Completely forgotten. Um, so when you were describing them, I was like, I don't know what this is. I have no idea what this is. In like out of character, my brain was like, fried trying to think of what this creature was and during the break I went and googled <laughs> a, an image of a woozle to make sure that I had had it clear in my head um, but I think the most exciting thing was well. definitely just meeting the characters and being able to feel like I was interacting with them one-on-one -on -one and getting to know them a little bit better uh, that was very rewarding to my child self well to be fair like any good GM I ran uh, fast and loose with those descriptions, especially because Reese's character specifically had in the backstory that they had previously encountered them. And I was like, well, I already had a vision for what I wanted this to be, but I don't want it to be immediately recognizable. So essentially I was like, this is, this is like the heffalumps you, this is a different heffalump than the kind you, well, like you've not seen one that looks like this. So I was like, I got to make this a little more challenging. So it's not, so it's a little confusing in that you see these heffalump tracks and you're like, oh, heffalumps. But then when you encounter them, they don't look the way you would maybe expect. Well, I think that worked out in the end because I think I failed the role to recognize the tracks. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, like my character was very, oh, yeah, I know what heffalumps look like. That is not a heffalump. So I think that was a case of the roles playing well to the story. 
Yeah, I was really happy about that. I was like, oh, this is going to, no one's going to know what's going on by the time you get to the path the North Yeah, it was really easy for me because both in and out of character, I was confused. So it worked out. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, sometimes that's the way to play it. (laughs) Sometimes that's just the way it is. uh, For sure. Um, With that, I think it would be, it'd be good to kind of go down this sidetrack. Um, were there things that you expected to show up that didn't? I was sad not to see Tigger. Yeah. Yeah. Purely because I, Tigger was one of my big ones as a kid. I I liked Tigger, but that's okay. (laughs) I would have loved more Owl. Mm. That was our fault. (laughs) It was. I, I knew it was going to happen, but I, I do love. I do love Owl and Tigger. I was, I definitely anticipated seeing Tigger at some point halfway through. Maybe he came in to like stir up trouble or distract us <laughs> in some way. Um, but I think Eeyore made up for it. So. Yeah, I feel like we, well, and that was, oh, I was going to say, I feel like we could have uh, seen a lot more Owl. <laughs> we just chose not to. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the way I was thinking about it, you could have encountered anybody. It was kind of about which direction you yeah. chose to go at any point in time. Literally, I mean, it comes down to player decisions. Any, which it was about which decision, which direction you went. In, because I had a map in front of me that determined who you were going to bump into first. And I, I tried to lay the groundwork for, for some options. Like, you know, Eeyore gave you options about who might have what knowledge and which way he wanted to go. And so you kind of took the path that you thought would be the most direct one. So there were contingencies for you to meet any any one of the classic, like, characters. It's just that I, and I didn't, Maybe that's something I could have done, too, was figure out how to bring them in more on the fly. But, like, you could have bumped into Kanga and Rue had you gone a little further to the northwest at one point. Um, Towards, you know, more towards, I don't remember exactly from the map that I had. But there were were ways you could have bumped into anybody. Um, You went right past Rabbit's Hole, but didn't stop. Hey, hey, we stole from Rabbit. Rabbit. (laughs) We just didn't stop to say hi. (laughs) Right. (laughs) We were really goal-oriented this Um, game, where it was like, we're we're just moving straight ahead. Uh, I'm not going to stop and chat, thanks. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, there would have been opportunities for you to go to Christopher Robin's house in the woods, Mm -hmm. whether you would have encountered him or not. I'm not sure. Like, that would have depended on how things went. Um... But I kind of placed everybody on the map, so it, it depended a lot about where y'all chose to go. <laughs> yeah, for you, Kira, were there, uh, do you think, unique challenges in adapting this work to a tabletop RPG? As someone who has run several successful Honey Heists previously, <laughs> now using uh, a very much so defined source material that's familiar to your players and others. Uh, yeah, the biggest challenge for me was I really wanted to try to stra- stay true to the characters and the lighthearted fact that these are children's stories. So I've run all kinds of honey heists in different sort of scenarios. I've done like a Halloween sort of one. I've done some heavier ones, some hilarious ones that were just more adult, not like X-rated <laughs> adult, but like just, you know, not not sort of based on children's stories so there were the big challenges there were like how do i stay true to the characters but still make it fun for people um and not feel like they have to be trapped in a world that maybe is designed for you know five to ten year olds or something (laughs) um how can i give them the freedom to play around with that and i think because of the characters that the players made it worked out great like there was still a lot of freedom to do that i wasn't i didn't feel like i was restricting them in any way um in that respect so Basically, it was just me not me, me wanting to do like justice and and sort of honor to the characters that I love, um, and and not change them too much. <laughs> yeah. And what I learned was apparently I make a good Eeyore. <laughs> it's a good skill to have in your portfolio, you know. <laughs> it is. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Uh, you touched a little bit on um, on some of the themes, right? This is a work of children's literature, um, and we are not in the happiest times. Um, so I guess looking at the work from 
either from your child lens or from your contemporary lens uh were there other themes that um come up in the stories or in the other representations in media that you think that it would have been interesting to explore but you didn't get a chance so this could be for players or for or for the game master i guess it you know the way it worked out was of course we were playing characters who were just passing through the hundred acre woods which was cut it was fun because it meant we got to um you know view these characters that we know as strangers and approach them you know from a very in-character perspective well like sure i love whoever but that doesn't mean my character cares at all you know and it's fun to play with that um but that did mean that i think we as characters didn't have any investment in like the interpersonal nature of the stories like you know for example you know Pooh and piglet like we they were they were both tools you know to our eventual ends to us because we we didn't care about <laughs> them as individuals um but you know we as the players do so i think that it would be interesting in considering an alternative way to approach something like this you know to have characters who know the original characters and are invested mm -hmm. in you know maybe there's been a fight you know maybe there's a fight in the hundred acre woods and you have to help them reconcile or solve a misunderstanding or something i think that's a different a way you could pull in those kind of interpersonal themes that kind of bring some of the life to the original stories um but you know i also loved just getting to come in and wreck things without <laughs> without caring about <laughs> the the characters so they both work I will say I did have a concept, an original concept, in which you were going to play the characters themselves. I thought, what if I just make them play the characters, and but give them a whole new adventure in the Hundred Acre Woods that has not happened before, that maybe included elements from the stories. But then I felt like, because, you know, when I was working on that, we didn't have a playlist, like, we didn't have players set yet, and I was like... I don't know how well people are going to know it. I want it to be accessible even if you don't know it. I didn't want to put the pressure on people of having to feel like they knew a character inside and out in order to, like, play that or feel weird about not playing it authentically and then like, running off in some weird direction with it. So that was kind of why I ultimately was like, let's let's put them in the story but not necessarily be an exclusive part of the story and I it could have been that you in fact lived in the hundred acre woods too mm -hmm. it just was an option that I chose to put you outside of it just because I think it works for the honey heist mechanism well of like you're coming into an environment you don't know you have to discover that environment in order to get away with whatever you're trying to get away with <laughs> yeah. we do have a comment from the chat on twitch uh that uh but Pooh was Scraps' best friend. So um, just to acknowledge that there was a relationship that was built on maybe some shifting sands. We're not going to judge mm -hmm. that relationship. Uh, but uh, our producer, who did play Scraps, mm -hmm. Jonathan Bradley, uh, wanted to be sure that we mentioned that. So. I mean, so we should mention, yeah, we had two other players in this game, um, and and only one of our four players was in fact a bear. Well, t two of them maybe. Um, we had a polar bear. Um, we had a fox. We had a uh, dog who thought they were mm -hmm, a bear. A great Pyrenees. Um, great Pyrenees, yeah. and we had a um, um, raccoon doing little hand possum. things like. Nope, not a raccoon. Possum. possum. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. We had a possum. Yeah. Grandmother. Gran. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that That's was right. that was a fun take on it for me. It's like, also, just because I, when we were putting things together and I was like, if you don't want to play a bear, that's fine. We can sort of, like, take the concept of a particular bear type and put it on a different animal. I honestly did not expect everyone to jump at that. I really thought, <laughs> like, the fact that we only ended up with one bear, uh, slash two bears um but of course yes scraps scraps his best friend was is is now mm -hmm. pooh bear in, well, in canonical lore of our i mean i think to just comment on that i'm f you know not my character but i'm fairly sure that almost everyone scraps has ever met qualifies as his best friend yes <laughs> yeah 
I think that's a fair assessment. Mm. <laughs> that does seem accurate. I would have, I, I actually would have um, really been interested to see Scraps and Taker. <laughs> oh, best friends for life right there. Oh yeah, yeah that yeah. energy, just playing off each other. I think my character <laughs> might have like passed out from like the level of activity there. <laughs> that seems fair. That seems fair. Uh, in the chat we have just true with a, a true. trail of uh, dots after it. Um, <laughs> I don't even know that we answered that question that you asked, Gail. I think we went so far afield from like the idea of themes, but we did talk about some other things that would have been fun to explore. So. Yeah, I think there is, you know, in, in the original work and in a lot of the, the works that have been derived from it, uh, there is a lot about like friendship and about like empathy and like building relationships and a lot of that does not necessarily lend itself to a honey heist um yes yeah. <laughs> so that was a little that was definitely devious of me to be like i'm gonna throw you in this environment that you're not necessarily invested in but everyone you meet is going to be all about friendship and community which was me driving you to want to help them not just to take the honey all of the honey and run but to to like be a part of like well let's fix this problem but also we'll get rewarded by doing that like kind of thing <laughs> so that was definitely intentional on my part like that was me driving in a certain direction but <laughs> yeah we definitely get at some of that and um you all mentioned a few things about your characters i've got a few questions about that we can kind of move in that direction uh yeah. do you feel like your characters were well suited for this adventure were there are there things you would have changed, you know, looking in hindsight? I mean, uh, for the adventure, yes. For the Hundred Acre Woods in general, maybe not. But as <laughs> as a bit of a subversion of it, I think it worked out. Um, it was interesting playing a character. I mean, my my character was Alistair the Fox, who was only along for the ride because he felt that he owed a life debt to Scraps for having saved him from a heffalump earlier in their history. So he had no investment to anything. <laughs> he was like, I'm here because my honor demands that I be here and also because I want to steal stuff. <laughs> um, uh, so he, he had no particular interest in making friends with any of the Hundred Acre Woods characters that we know and love. Um, so, you know, if it had been a more friendship oriented game, probably wouldn't have been super appropriate. But I think for, you know, as a heist, um, it worked out to have a character who was primarily interested in just being a thief. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so he know. was oh, oh sorry i was just gonna oh, say he was meant as a bit of a subversion to some of the other characters anyway uh, which mostly happened when i picked the name because everyone else chose you know short cute names and i thought that it would just be funnier <laughs> it would just be funny to play counterpoint to that and have a fox named alistair so it worked well i wouldn't expect any less from a fox you know but yeah alex go ahead Oh, sure, yeah. So Nook was pretty low-key. He was, in fact, the only real bear and still acknowledges that he is the only real bear. Uh, he's very, very confused by the dog trying to be a bear and the other dog being something else. Cough, a fox. <laughs> so <laughs> very confused about all of that, very confused about the North Pole. He's a polar bear, and he's very familiar with the poles. It's not, not no, what it was not, it yep. was very confusing. So he's like, I just left there. How on earth could I have gotten there again? And Nook was the muscle, so he was a swimmer. He kind of played the uh, transportation for Gran. Gran just kind of hung on and <laughs> got to nap while we were moving around. Um, I think out of character, I, I, I forgot we were criminals. I was kind of having just a little adventure in the Hundred Acre Woods and forgot that what I really wanted was honey because I was like, ooh, we get to meet people. Uh, but my character was mostly there because he needed a new adventure. He was bored where he was. He's a washed up polar bear. So he literally washed up in the Hundred Acre Woods and was like, sure, this will pass the time just fine. So it, it worked out um, for myself and the character, but I definitely, that, that criminal element kind of got lost on me multiple well, times because I remember <laughs> getting after Alistair it's like put his tail back 
you don't need to take his tail put it back like okay quit, quit being rude like i be mean nice to, to be fair as a whole we were not very criminal statistically like we never we were right. very bare because we kept succeeding so we had to we had to eat honey a lot but we never had to do a criminal flashback because we just never got criminal enough so right. you're kind of right <laughs> Yeah, so that was a mechanism I didn't mention in this game. If you feel like you're becoming too much of a bear, you can eat some honey. And if you feel like you're being too much of a criminal, or maybe it's, I can't, I might have just slipped that. Uh, you can have a flashback. I, as a GM, was super disappointed there were no flashback scenes. I love live for that element of Honey Heist, so I was really bummed that there was no call for a flashback. We just should have failed more often. <laughs> <laughs> you You all rolled so well, I mean, which is good, because that's, you know what you want for players but also i was like oh, i had at least one pretty solid flashback, flashback scene planned uh <laughs> kid friendly i promise but he was in security so it was very dramatic but that's all right yeah i figured if we if i ever had to do a flashback we'd just go back into like the history of alistair and scraps uh, yes so fun <laughs> oh a missed a missed opportunity but you never know what you're going to need uh and that is a, an mm -hmm. interesting mechanic with um honey heist um a good opportunity for role playing the good news is there were plenty of opportunities to get your hands on some honey so that nobody went uh fully fully uh you know one way or the other and we didn't have to cut the game short <laughs> <laughs> with hilarious consequences yeah uh, let's see here. What else do we have? So we've talked about since most of the NPCs in this in this game uh, were familiar to you. Um, was there anyone that particularly stood out that really either you felt like your character really got along with or that you just really enjoyed interacting with? I enjoyed the bees. <laughs> which is not a familiar character but the bees that weren't bees and then the bees that were bees were both mm -hmm. both very fun to interact with um but as far as an in-character standpoint i think i really enjoyed uh alistair's brief connection with the woozles <laughs> as recognition so of fellow sneaky fellow sneaky animals yep. i think as far as who had the most impact on my character i think the, the woozles were the only ones who had any impact on my character but i enjoyed the bees i i think i'd have to go with piglet i think my character uh is secretly kind of a big softy I mean, Gren was literally attached to his fur the entire game, just chilling out, sleeping, and bossing him around a little bit. He was just fine <laughs> with that. He was like, eh, it's useful. And I think Piglet was so nervous and frightened, especially of Nook, that like, okay, well, how about you ride on my back? And Piglet was just like sitting on the back, just trembling and being like, okay, maybe we'll be all right. Uh, I think that was very fun because uh, he was already kind of a softie, but that softened him up a little bit more. And I think that was playing into the themes that Kira designed was for us to not screw them over and, in fact, help solve a problem. So I think uh, I followed the trope pretty, pretty well. <laughs> Um, so the wrong, the wrong sort of, the quote from the, the actual story, and that was part of what was in my notes, is the wrong sort of bees who would make the wrong sort of honey, and that is an actual quote from Pooh Bear. Um, and that was something I just took and ran, because I was like, oh, well, what does that even mean? And then, like, what, what are bees that are not bees? They look like bees, but they don't smell like bees, and they don't, you know... Um, and they, you know, make something that looks like honey, but doesn't taste like honey... Um, so for me, that was really fun to just come up with the idea of these sort of vaguely criminal bees who were working for a bigger criminal entity to just be a foil, like a little foil for you that you won over anyway, because they're like, well, I mean, we don't really like what we're doing. We don't know what else to do. <laughs> I mean, I love the, the concept of not bees, like not anything. The thing that was not a bee. This is such a tangent because this is not a horror game it would be really funny if it was but i there's this one post that i've seen a few times about like 
creepy concepts that I really enjoy that's like there's a few main there's like the thing that was not a deer the thing that was almost a deer the thing that wasn't a deer anymore like the thing that wanted to be a deer like all these and I miss I'm missing something out of that but just the way all of those carry different connotations of like why it's terrifying you know why the thing that was not a deer implies that it it looked like it almost was but clearly it wasn't the thing that wasn't a deer anymore something you know changed like just those different things that make us that freaks us out about those concepts i think are fascinating and again obviously not approaching this from a horror angle because they were just kind of stuffed <laughs> I mean... bees but that there was that element of it of the like the not bees like what makes them not bees and then we found out but like that element of being defined by what you aren't i think mm -hmm. makes for a really fascinating sort of mystery element i really enjoyed it <laughs> not to get into i could get into narratology with this and i want I mean, no, like I disnarration mean. but yeah it was really i i just enjoy that concept being utilized especially in kid language because mm -hmm. like the not bees like the, that yeah that makes her, like perfect sense within a children's story also to refer to them in the way they were referred the, yeah and and I really had fun with the idea of just, like, making them aware. Like, they, they know they're not bees, but their job is to act like bees and convince others that they are bees. So what does it take to, like, get them to admit that and then just be like, eh, that's fine, we'll just go away. We don't really like this job. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll go be not bees somewhere else. <laughs> I hadn't really thought about how that is a little like uncanny valley. Um, like there's there's this like attraction and revulsion to what does the not be and why is it here and why is it upsetting everything? Well, I <laughs> but... always I always think it's really cool, like I said, to to describe things by what they aren't because the fact that you're using that term in the first place, like it's when you have a character saying like he's not mad he is not mad it's like okay but <laughs> you know you're clearly on the verge of being mad or somewhere in the realm of being mad or you wouldn't need to say so or like the romantic thing of like something happens like you're you know the two characters who like each other are spending time together and the narration goes you know she did not kiss him that means she was thinking about it that means it was there. Like, so, you know, technically to say it was not a bee means it could be literally anything. But because the association is made between it and a bee, we know it's in the realm of being like a bee or maybe is supposed to be a bee or is trying to be a bee, but not knowing where that line falls, knowing that it's not a bee, but not knowing why it's not a bee is where the ambiguity and the like uncanny valley comes in yeah and in the original story they're just described as wrong bees that make the wrong That's kind it. of honey but there's very little like because it's a children's story so there's not going to be a deep dive into what do wrong bees mean and what does the wrong honey mean um so this was really fun to take just for and I mean, I just, I mean, I fixated on that because it made sense for a honey heist, but it's also just one of those lines that kind of stuck with me, like the wrong bees that make the wrong honey. What does that mean? What can we do with that? Like, how does that become a challenge? Um, you know, that I think was really fun. Yeah, and the way that you all addressed that conflict, um, I thought was, it was very entertaining to watch as a member of your audience. Um, but how do you feel about how you resolved the conflict? And I guess were there, you know, as a kind of continuation about uh, or with that, were there other ways that you maybe initially thought about resolving that conflict or ways that you knew you didn't want to resolve the conflict? I think I anticipated a little more action, uh, just b based solely on other Honey Heist games where there is usually at least one ridiculous vaguely elaborate plan where we're all doing something different at the same time and we are trying to coordinate that and all meet at the same endpoint, right? And this was largely dialogue based. 
Mm -hmm. Dialogue and um, small decisions. I felt like there were a lot of like very small little decisions that kind of added up to where we ended up progressing. So I, I anticipated more action, but I'm very happy with how it turned out. Like it was still a rewarding experience, but I wondered if like the muscle would come in. I think I'm thinking about it from my character's perspective because he's, he's the muscle. Mm -hmm. He's there to protect and lift heavy things and growl sure. like a real bear. Um, yeah. I mean, a necessary. polar bear fighting bees or not bees <laughs> would have also been very entertaining. <laughs> Right, and instead I just got to like catch it and then hold it there and say, like, just, yeah. okay, hold it open a crack. Are we going to talk to him? We're going to talk to him? Okay. I think you shook him up a couple times, though. You were intimidating. Oh, yes. We, we did do a little shaking just to be like, we're, we're serious about this, mister. But um, <laughs> no damage done, and we did let them go, and no aggression was really needed. And I, I think I anticipated needing to play that as the, as the muscly, grumpy polar bear. Um, but was happy I didn't. I would have been happy either way, I think, but. It was, uh, I was in an interesting position near the end of the conflict because I was outside of the, like, main action because, uh, I had chosen to go and, like, scout ahead and because Alistair is kind of a coward, like, he doesn't want to just run straight in. So he was like, I'm just going to stay out here. Like, I'm good out here. Uh, I'm going to see what's going on. And, you know, so I ended up having to make decisions by myself, but which is always nerve wracking as a player uh, in any situation, both because it's like, okay, I don't want to take control of the narrative too much on the one hand. Um, and I also don't want to mess it up. <laughs> and also just coming from like D and D five uh, E also like the don't split the party thing where it's like, Oh God, I'm by myself. If anything goes wrong, I'm dead. Um, so it was, <laughs> I, I was feeling the pressure of like, trying to figure out okay what do I do here I've put myself uh alone you know out here and so I ended up sneaking around to the back and trying to just sneak in and I I kind of ended up being able to if I remember correctly to de-escalate um which was a relief because <laughs> I was like I'm gonna go in there and immediately just get captured that's what's gonna happen I'm gonna get stomped I'm gonna get stomped by a heffalump <laughs> like and I ended up being able to talk talk him down uh, so I, I am relieved uh, that it worked out the way it did because it definitely could have gone very wrong for Alistair. As a, well, and Alistair also really impressed those Jaguars in the trees oh, the Jaguars, to the point that they were not just like... Not the ja Jaguars. Yeah, that's the that's one I meant you, to say you, earlier. You were the only one, that's yeah, the one I meant to who really earlier. encountered the Jaguars. Yeah, yeah. I take it back. When I, said, when I said <laughs> Woozles in answer to favorite NPCs, I meant Jaguars. <laughs> it was months ago. <laughs> It's true. Yeah, no. Well, and and for those of you who aren't familiar with Honey Heist, if you're out there watching, you know, there is not a mechanism for combat like you would have in D&D, &D, but it doesn't mean you can't fight. Um, many of the, like, Bill Bears have skills or either would have skills or roles conceivably in a game that would be useful for combat, and you just navigate it with the two skills that you have, being bear or criminal. So, I mean, I totally had plans for if you all just decided to go into that criminal style shack out past the north pole and try to fight um you could have totally done that like i was prepared for that as well like um or any one of you you know alistair being alone in the woods could have tried to fight that jaguar probably not the best idea <laughs> but you know any one of you there could have been fights at, at a certain couple of points but instead you all took a, a really different route that's actually one of the things that surprised me not that i expected you to to go like as the, the D, D phrase murder hobo and just run on in there um, no, that would have been quite the but, approach to a hundred acre wood game <laughs> just yeah. kill everyone <laughs> i mean if you it, it's you know you could have just gone totally chaotic evil and been we want this honey we don't want to share any of it or give any of it back it's possible <laughs> could have been a real interesting ending <laughs> we did steal some you did steal some and you got some as a reward <laughs> <laughs> yeah both definitely uh, I'm going to harken back quick to what Reese said about it being nerve wracking taking over the narrative of the game for a little bit as your fellow player, I did not notice. I oh, thought good. you played it super cool, and it worked out really well, and it all was like it flowed together really well. 
So Good, I'm glad. Yeah, I thought it was a natural I, thing. I did not ex- <laughs> I did not expect to split the party, so I was a little unprepared for that. And I was like, all right, we'll just roll with it. Um, I mean, I'm used to having you know, Honey Heist games where people split up and do everything at once, but it's usually, like, a plan that everybody has a piece of. Um, and so this, because there wasn't a plan, per se, we just ended up with the party split. I was a little bit unprepared for that, to, but I sort of muddled my way through. <laughs> I think it worked out. Like a GM does. That's right. <laughs> just make it up anyway. Yep. You just roll with it. Uh, in the chat, uh, Scraps has contributed that Scraps is not a fighter. He's a friend maker. So that's that how true. he would like to solve all conflicts is how I read that. Just always. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say you all necessarily befriended the Heffalumps and Wootzels, but you you de-escalated the situation. You convinced them to leave and perhaps go find some of their cousins um, and, you know, sort of restored things within the Hundred Acre Woods. So... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Scraps probably ran off after this, this adventure ended to maintain friendships with all of them, I'm sure. <laughs> See, I don't think we really got off on the right foot back there. You know, let's... Can we still yeah, be friends? Let's still be friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. That's also how I imagine it. Um, <laughs> me. So, we, we talked... Uh, a little bit in a kind of a few of the topics we've covered about previous experience with role playing games. Uh, and in your crew, you had some folks who've played in several Honey Heist games and someone who has played in no Honey Heist games. So, how, I guess, how did that previous experience kind of figure into either decisions that y'all made as uh, players in the session? Or how you um, planned or adapted as the game master for the session, Kira? I mean, I I was kind of in an in-between phase. I've never played a Honey Heist game before this, but I have watched uh, Honey Heist games be played in uh, actual play shows. Uh, So I was familiar with the um, general mechanics and the chaos that can ensue. Uh, so I had kind of a model in my mind, but it was my first time trying to figure, mostly I think picking the roles and deciding how I would play to my role um, was probably the thing I kind of gained experience with while, you know, playing that I hadn't had to think about just, you know, watching it be played. Um, so I, I, it was helpful for me for sure. I, I would have been more nervous, I think, if I'd gone in without having ever seen Honey Heist played out. Um, but it was very fun as a first, as a first kind of dipping my toes into it. Yeah, and in our planning session, um, you all, because we didn't have a full party of six, you know, you all, I let you pick everything. You So you had some control over picking your roles, but without knowing where it was going to go, as opposed to just rolling and letting the dice decide, you know, what, what bear you were going to be, what role you were going to have you know, what the, how that was going to play out. Yeah. So I have played Honey Heist, uh, before that was my third, third heist, I believe, uh, with Kira as the DM and my previous games, I played a different character who is much more animated and smaller and hyperactive and (laughs) annoying possibly and, uh, tech savvy. Well, he thinks he's tech savvy. Uh, so this time I, thought I would change it up a little bit because usually I'm relying on the muscle to get me places because uh, my other character is a honey badger so you know it's far off the ground can't really do much except like groundhog it um (laughs) so this time I was like oh I'll, I'll change it up a little bit more be someone a little more gentler for this particular setting and that that was fun um I'm sorry my cat wants to say hello to everyone so I apologize no apologies um, needed. Yes, I think What's he wants out, so I might need to do that. Oh, yes, Finn, <laughs> Finn the cat. You saw his tail earlier, I believe. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, but it was interesting because I... Most of my gaming experience, I play like 50% myself and 50% something random so that I don't fail miserably because my role-playing is it's iffy at best. 
And this time I, I wasn't really sure where to go because I'm not a grumpy old polar bear. I'm grumpy, maybe, but uh, <laughs> grumpy male older polar bear was... Uh, <laughs> It was an interesting experience, and I really liked it. I thought Nook was just kind of a sweetheart along for the ride. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoyed that we got to, you know, have a session zero and work out some of that personality and and interaction, you know, before we jumped into the session. Because it's, it's hard to develop a nuanced personality in, like, a two-hour game. So you do have to kind of rely on, my character has one main trait, and I'm going to play to that trait. Um, but it definitely helped to be able to kind of hash out character dynamics beforehand. I enjoyed doing that. Because, um, I, I mean, I have no problem with role-playing. I've, you know, I've been playing D&D &D for a few years, but have been role-playing in various other ways for half my life. So I enjoy, you know, just jumping into a character who is not like me, but it, it is, since I'm mostly used to playing in long campaigns, um, where you have the time to really develop your character's personality a lot, it is a fun little kind of exercise challenge to play one shots where it's like, like I said, like, okay, I'm picking a, a, a personality trait and I'm just hitting that as hard as I can. <laughs> and that's going to be how I develop this character. So it's just a different way of, of, playing the game really it is a unique exercise i have trouble condensing anything uh, i talk a lot i when i write i write too much and when i develop characters it's just usually fairly uh detailed so creating these one-shot characters where i cannot do that i don't have the time energy space or need to do that is like a really good exercise for me as a human and also as a player <laughs> Where I can like, okay, like you said, pick one, one like trait, one skill. What is my cat doing? And just roll with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I feel you there. I also like, there's a, a really, not a one shot, but a very short, like a few sessions um, campaign that I've been kind of roped into with some of my friends. And so we were making characters for them and I, I, me and a friend had kind of been like, okay, our characters are going to know each other. And I came to them afterwards, like, okay, do we want to plot this? Like, do we want to, do we want to go deep with this? Like come up with lots of details about like how, what our backstory is. And she was like, I don't want to get too deep into this because they're probably going to die. <laughs> like, I don't want to get too attached because this is like a competition battle royal kind of like, I, um, so let's, let's not. And I had to rein myself back in. So definitely fear you on the <laughs> desire to just create a detailed plot and backstory for every character. I, I help one of my friends create D and D characters for his campaigns. And he's like, all right, this is what the character in the setting is. Give me that backstory. So I'll write up, you know, two, three, four pages of backstory, and it's like, ah, maybe this polar bear doesn't need two to four pages of backstory in detail. <laughs> but maybe he does. He wants sometimes. It. Well, and and as a as a GM, this was kind of a different, like having even though have I've run several honey heights before, I did some different things with this because you were only encountering other animals. There's a whole mechanism of this game that was never employed which is what happens when your bears, or in this case, animals, encounter mm -hmm. humans. Mm -hmm. Because when you encounter humans and you're a bear, are you pretending to be a human? Is there a reason that you're pretending to be a human in a bear costume? Are you just accepting that you're a bear and trying to scare people? Um, or carnage them if you're a honey badger? Um, and there is like a whole mechanism as well in the game where you, um, as, as animal characters or as bears, can be... Um, can acquire human clothing to have costumes that add to a whole aspect of how believable you are when you encounter humans. Um, but there was none of that in this game. Like I just sort of pulled that mechanism out, um, which was a little sad because I really appreciate that mechanism and I think it's a lot of fun, but it just did not fit in to this particular storyline because if you encountered anyone, it was going to be Christopher Robin and this would not be new to him. <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't going to be like, who are these animals? These are different. Why um, is there a bear at my house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was a little sad um, that we didn't have the costumes because that is one part of Honey Heist that I can get a tiny bit detailed with. Is like 
drawing over the the bear images to create my character. <laughs> so I've had like a blonde wig and a, a cape before. And I, I do like that little aspect, but it, it would not have made sense in this context. So it makes sense that it was removed. Yes, the rule sheets and character sheets for Honey Heist are available on the internet for free, and they do include drawings of bears that you can color in and put your costume features on. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what Alex was referring to in a couple of games I've run. People have started drawing and coloring their character sheets to then share in the course of the game. Yeah. Um, previous to this, the game I had run was a Halloween-themed Honey Heist, so we had a bear in a Boba Fett helmet, <laughs> and people, bears with wings and tutus, and... Um, yeah, it, <laughs> uh, so that can be a really, really fun element. And like I said, I'm sad we, it didn't fit here. So I'm sad we didn't get to use it, but I don't know that it was a loss per se. It was just, it's just a different element of the game, um, that you can, and it is an optional element. You don't, you don't ever have to be in that situation, but. Gosh, speaking of the wrong bees, I'm hearkening back to the Halloween game. We had ghost bees. Mm -hmm. So really, there were yes. ghost bees in the Halloween game. So, yes, they were haunting. I'm a sensing house a theme <laughs> and protecting something. Uh, yes. <laughs> the bee development is always uh, something I look forward to in these honey heists. Like, what are, what are the what are they going to do? What are they going to do? <laughs> and it, this game was a and, and and Alex can attest to this, and Kayla can as well. I'm a big fan of puns. This game, it was a lot harder to get the puns in. I, <laughs> I was not able to do that to the level that I would normally commit to. Um, and I don't know why. I don't know if it was because I had just changed so many things about it or it felt weird to, like, incorporate a lot of that. I did some of it, but I couldn't do quite as much as I normally would. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Do we... We've talked a little bit about um, about <laughs> this, but... What was the biggest uh, surprise that you had during the session? Was there anything that just really caught you off guard? Uh, scraps. Scraps <laughs> caught me off guard. <laughs> I was the bear, and then this dog is running around being like, but I'm a bear. I'm a bear, right? <laughs> and I... <laughs> I'm not quick enough on my feet to like play characters super well and like wittily so my character was just like vaguely annoyed the whole time <laughs> and like confused about what animals were what because I think I think I played him like Nook went in thinking they would all be bears and then no one else was a bear except one wanted to be a bear and one could have been a, I don't know um, <laughs> so I think uh, that that relationship building and this this has happened twice now with uh, Jonathan's characters and my character kind of go at each other because one wants to be <laughs> friends and the other one's like, uh. <laughs> and I enjoy that dynamic a lot even when we play vastly different characters. Uh, but I think that that aspect of player interaction was mm -hmm. the surprise for me. And maybe, maybe yeah. the, the woozles, because I really... I just don't remember what heffalumps and woozles look like other than the scary nightmare dream from one of the Winnie the Pooh movies. Yeah, it's um, fair. Yeah. Yeah. So. I will interject there to say from the chat, uh, there was a comment that friendships only last if you put in the effort to maintain them. That was from something we discussed earlier, but it is a truism from scraps. So <laughs> if, you don't say <laughs> just in case you need that in your life. Uh, that is, is in the chat. Scraps, scraps and, and Nook can have a buddy comedy special and Jax and Pockets can oh, have... Oh, the Jax and oh. Pockets was my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. Uh, I don't know what I would say is the biggest surprise. I mean, we've already talked about the kind of my choice <laughs> to, to be, to split the party uh, later on. I guess just the bees, like <laughs> just the whole bee scenario <laughs> was a surprise. You know, I had no idea what the story was going to be. Um, so the bees were a fascinating kind of uh, plot point to be hooked around. Um, I'm always kind of nervous about like mysteries in role-playing games because um, I don't feel that I'm the best at figuring them out in the moment. Um, so I'm always like, I don't know what to do with this. I sure hope that we're making the right decision by following the bees, because I don't know where we're going to end up. Um, 
So I think that like I'm always kind of on my toes when there's a mystery uh, that the, that the story kind of hinges around because I'm like I want to put in my part, uh, but I don't know if I'm going the right way. <laughs> I, I get that a lot where I'm like, I don't know, so I'm just not gonna, or I'm gonna do it in full force. It's, there's no medium <laughs> for me. Like, it's way easier to play spazzy characters because they can just go, but when you have to have a character that's like really thinking about things, it's like, oh, crap. Well, it's so useful to have, even if it's not your character, to have a character in your party who will just go, okay, I do this now. Uh, yeah. is really good for a party, I think. Like, that was obviously Scraps in, in this game, which was good because it meant we could be deliberating and then Scraps would go, I run to them and we just have to run with that, <laughs> which stops the game from stalling as the nervous characters or the thinking characters, you know, overthinking characters don't know what to do. And I've definitely played that person before where it's like, you know what? I'm gonna just go. I'm just gonna run at it. I'm not gonna sit here and think too much. And it's a good way to break myself out of, cause I'm very cautious and I I don't like to take risks uh, and I like to overthink. So to be able to play a character who doesn't do that is liberating. But even if you're not that character, just having someone in the party who will keep, who will prevent us from just deliberating for an hour <laughs> is good. Right. <laughs> well and I think actually that's a good point that was one of the big surprises for me because as a GM you never know what to expect from people but that being said I've played in it with two or, or I have you know either played in games or or run games for two people that played in this session so you not that you necessarily can predict people's behavior but there are certain things you might expect from certain players or you know they're going to drive the action that way like you don't know what they're going to do but you know if it's taking too long they're going to do something to make it happen so that was for me not so much a surprise in and of itself it's more the I don't know what's going to happen when that happens and I have no idea how I'm going to react to it in the moment and what, what my like role as GM then becomes like what if I haven't thought about the scenario that's going to happen? And then I've got to figure out on the fly, like, how, how that's going to play out. <laughs> yeah, and, and with that, Kira, do you have any sort of advice or any kind of suggestions for someone who might be designing a one-shot like this uh, for the first time? Yeah, so I will, um, so first a couple of things. Like, uh, Honey Heist is my gateway to GMing. It is the first RPG that I ever GMed. Um, and I've run, I think, five or six games now. Um, and I think the nice thing about it is because it is a simpler system than, say, 5e, um, it is a really great gateway for people who want to learn to, to try GMing. Um, it's, it's a chaotic game, but it's open. The um, rule set that exists out there can give you, like, if you have no idea how to start, the rule set will give you scenarios, and you can just roll to develop a scenario. And then you don't have to do anything on top of that except be prepared to try and play out that scenario. Um, alternatively, like this game, you can throw that out the window and just build based on the concepts that you have. Um, but it's also a good middle of the road where you can take some of the basics and add on to them or tinker with them a little bit. Um, so I think it's a great platform for that. It also lends itself to a lot of experimentation. So like I said, obviously we ran a Winnie the Pooh themed game. Was that ever the intention behind Honey Heist? Who knows? But I've done it now. Um, and I previously ran a Halloween themed one, like I said. So the idea that you can customize it in different ways, but still do it to the level that you're comfortable um, is really, really great. So I think it's a great gateway to sort of learning how to wrap your head around designing a game for players uh because uh that being said i last night play tested um it was the first time i ever gm'd a 5e game which was a very different experience uh and i'm play testing that for that was a play test for uh the next stream that will be on roll of play um but that was a totally different experience but i felt good because i'm like even though i haven't gm'd in this system I am prepared for the unexpected i have realized i don't have to have everything and every potential like possibility in my notes mm -hmm. because I'm a creative person and I can deal with it on the fly <laughs> and what are the players going to do about it I'm in <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
money heist as it as a sort of gateway has given me a lot of confidence in my ability to be more improv based in GMing. So like the playtest I ran last night, I have a lot of notes, but not nearly as many notes as I might have had if I hadn't experienced something a little easier. Um, and the same thing for this game, I, I have notes, but they were largely like reminders to myself about characteristics of these classic characters that I wanted to incorporate, or notes about possible false leads, or possible hints and how you would, you know, get them, just things you want to remember. Um, also, in this case, I was really lucky because I'm really bad about names and coming up with names on the fly, so I always have random lists of names. I did have some of that here because I didn't. I came up with names for bees <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, if somebody asks me what their names are, I'm just going to stare at them blankly <laughs> and not know. Um, so, so yeah, I had notes, but it was largely just little reminders for myself, and I just sort of let the story go and, and see what people did, so... Uh, so that would be my advice too, which is pretty classic, and I think we've heard that on roll call before. Is don't try to plan for everything. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to. <laughs> you will not be able to. <laughs> Your players could do literally anything, and sometimes they do. Yep. <laughs> yeah. For sure. For sure. Oh me. Let's see here. Um, in the course of kind of discussing these things, have y'all thought of any other questions that you'd have for? each other that you want to pose before we move into some kind of wrap up questions. Are there other literature based honey heists in the works? <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe <laughs> I am, uh, I'm my next, uh, the next thing I'm doing on stream is next Friday, which is a Sherlock Holmes inspired. Uh, later in the semester, there might be another honey heist. I'm trying to work on an idea for later in the semester, but I'm torn between a honey heist game and a, because uh, honey heist is always fun, and there are plenty of opportunity for other stories that we could fit around this um, that are not children's lit specific, which might, you know, open up some other possibilities. Um, but I'm also toying with running a Dadlands game, uh, which is a similar concept in that it's very simple. You, uh, you, you play an archetypal figure, and um, it is not actually a dice-based system, so we'll have to come up with a modification for that. It actually, in practice, involves pulling poker chips out of a fanny pack uh, <laughs> to represent law and chaos. Um, <laughs> like you do. But I think we could find a way to do that with dice rolls. So it's possible um, something will happen at the end of the semester. It might be Honey Heist, it might be Dadlands, or very likely uh, next semester there would be something else as well. So always up for the challenge i just haven't come up with a plan for that or settled on a story for either situation i vaguely toyed with a honey heist themed around lord of the rings <laughs> or the hobbit but <laughs> yeah. like like a real gritty one in opposition to winnie the pooh we could do a real gritty honey heist <laughs> literally in the chat moments before you said it out loud was lord of the rings question yeah. mark <laughs> uh, yeah 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 uh, I'm definitely considering that. That may maybe will be something we do in the fall. Now, because um, I think that would lend. Are itself. we talking about bears? Because I just had the image of a hobbit going full criminal, which was very what? funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I have to think. I haven't really, like I said, I haven't really thought that one through uh, a hundred a, a long way. But uh, it would be, yeah. How do just you play hobbit? Replace bears criminal going... with burglar, and you've got it. <laughs> I mean, pretty much. That's what we would be doing. You'd be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Hobbits are pretty bear-like. It be a real. It's it, it, like I said. It would be a very gritty game in comparison to this one. But I'm up for that. Like I'm used to actually. This is probably the most like innocent and cute game I've ever <laughs> been in or run. So I was like, this is a very different feel for me as a DM, as a GM too. Um. <laughs> for sure. Uh, that's a good transition into our first wrap-up question. Um, we've still got, we've got about 15 minutes left, so if there are other questions that come up for each other, we definitely still have time to, to talk about those too. But I wanted to make sure we had time to talk about any other works of literature or media that you think could give a similar experience to this session. Any other pieces that you would point folks to if they really enjoyed watching this session 
or really enjoyed Winnie the Pooh. I mean, well, I will say it not necessarily literature related, but if you are interested in Honey Heist based on this, there are some really great real plays out there. If you want to see the more traditional version of Honey Heist played, I highly recommend them. Um, I'm sure there are a bunch of them. I know there are at least a few out there. I'm sure there are a lot more. Um, but if you go looking for them, I highly recommend it because you might get a very different experience than, than what we did. Um, other, I mean, obviously now I'm talking about The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings in a sort of Honey Heist context. Um, other things. I'm trying to think about other things that would work really well for Honey Heist. I guess so. my brain is going in the direction of other children's literature with anthropomorphic <laughs> animals. Uh, yeah, also and, yeah. great. So I think I actually never really read the Redwall series. I read the first book in middle I read, I read the first book those. in middle school yeah. and I just I just couldn't get into it. So I haven't read them all, but I imagine that, you know, if one likes Winnie the Pooh, one would probably, if they're not me apparently, also like Redwall. <laughs> I was really into the Mist Mantle Chronicles when I was young, which is another kind of um, you know, anthropomorphic uh, animals, uh talking animals books like but they were they were children's books but they were not really small children's books like Winnie the Pooh they had some deeper uh kind of plot lines and some some more you know still children's but more mature themes so if you want the the you know children's tale aspect of Winnie the Pooh but the potential for maturity that comes from the Honey Heist game I don't know maybe those would be good yeah, I was definitely thinking, like, if you, the more, I guess they, they, I read them as children, so I think they constitute children's lit, but again, on the grittier side, like, uh, either Watership Down or um, Tail Chaser's Song, which is similar to Watership Down, but it's about cats. Um, and they're not anthropomorphic, they are actually, in Watership Down, they're rabbits, and in, in Tail Chaser's Song, they're cats, but both of them involve the hunt for something specific, mm -hmm. so I think you could tweak them in a way that would allow the animals to go on an adventure seeking something um whether they're seeking it for theft or not um you could definitely tweak both of those stories and they would definitely be a little darker and grittier um depending on you know how you wanted to approach them if you're thinking about it from a children's lit perspective um Otherwise, I'm trying to think of good, like, heist mm. stories mm -hmm. or heist literature, but that's not necessarily a genre that I've spent a lot of time the best reading in. So. The best heist stories I know, not children's literature, but the best heist stories I know are fantasy books. Uh, one is uh, the first book of the Mistborn series uh, is a heist, um, Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson great series um but the first book is explicitly a heist um and it's really fun mm -hmm. the other one is six of crows by lee bardugo uh which is another great fantasy heist story uh so i would highly recommend both of those just as something to read if you like heists <laughs> <laughs> awesome I went awesome. the exact opposite of wholesome when I thought of like works of literature or media to adapt to Honey Heist and didn't think about the heist part as much, uh, but I'm big in the horror sci-fi genres a lot, so I, I could apply any of those myself, but I think <laughs> um, not super gritty, but still like eerie and creepy would be like a Lovecraftian spin on things, like less <laughs> taking from specific plot points and more just that theme and some of the you know monsters and creations that appear uh if we're going <laughs> slightly more wholesome i would say artemis fowl i i loved those books growing up and that first it, it, it's a bit of a mystery it's a little bit of a heist it's a little bit of adventure there's some humans and yet there's some elves and it's you know oh in the world of artemis fowl now we're bears trying to get the the fairy gold or something like that yeah, yeah it, i think that would be fun that's good there's a lot of heist potential to draw from from the various artemis fowl books yeah yeah for sure sure and i'm also thinking maybe about like stories from <clears throat> classical mythology that might be fun ways to approach like getting something whether it's honey but getting a treasure or getting a thing or adventuring to a place or from a place to get to get somewhere um, there would be probably some stories from like Ovid that might lend themselves to that sure. sort of exploration too. 
Yeah, definitely. I think there's... As a short-time classics, or near classics minor in college, <laughs> I gotta go back to those roots, too. <laughs> yeah, I think there are a lot of... Uh, depending on what really spoke to you about this play, like, playthrough and this uh, this work, there are a lot of great options out there, for sure. Um and we've talked a little bit already about upcoming sessions that we're excited about. Uh, I'm looking to see if I have the list of other upcoming sessions. Um, so yeah, next week we're doing uh, Sherlock Holmes style uh, classical five, like classic five E um, sort of how do you combine logic and deduction? Although maybe there's less of that than I originally intended. <laughs> with magic and fantasy uh and then after that is i think a game johnson's running that i'm maybe i think i'm signed up to play in which is dante's inferno which i am also very excited about because also gonna be real fun <laughs> yeah i am literally reading dante's inferno right now for an epics class nice. uh so yeah i might nice. i might sign up for that one because i saw that that was an option it was like that would dovetail real well <laughs> with my current mm -hmm. studies there's a lot of potential there, uh, and having played many games under the guidance of Jonathan as the GM, I'm very excited to see where that goes. <laughs> so I get to play in the Sherlock Holmes game next week, and I'm so stoked. I, uh, under the direction of Kira, of course, purchased the entire Sherlock Holmes collection because it's been years since I've read real Sherlock Holmes. Like, I watched The Great Mouse Detective pretty recently, but that's... <laughs> That's about it. So I am. Um... We're not going to touch on that. This is kind <laughs> now of that would be Sherlock Holmes as Honey Heist, right? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Sure. Yes. yes, perfect yes. combination yeah. there. So I, I'm reading it this week. I'm getting a couple stories under my belt to get the vibe, and I'm really excited about it. I love, love all things thriller and mystery. So looking forward to it. Excellent. And we do have lots of opportunities for our folks to be involved, right? So. Uh, Reese is our friend from the English department, uh, not a librarian at all. I'm also not a librarian at all, but we like <laughs> role-playing games and talking about literature, and we're here. So if you are like that kind of person, you know, and you're either affiliated with Virginia Tech in some way, or you live in the New River Valley, or you're affiliated with libraries in some way, any of those ors. Uh, we would love for you to reach out about taking part in uh, Role of Play. So we have, like we've talked about, we've got some uh, opportunities to do um, play testing. So we try to play test every game before it's played live on the air with a different set of folks. So uh, the reactions that you see live on the air are authentic, and this is the first time that they're hearing that information. But it's very useful for the game master to be able to play through it ahead of time and make adjustments. So we usually have two sets of four people that play through every session over the course of that time. Uh, and that's right. We also have... Um, we would really like to hear if you have pieces of literature that you think should be adapted to uh, one shots. So you can also reach out with that information. Uh, you can submit your suggestions or reach out with questions to rollofplay-g at vt.edu. And you can also, in the chat, you've got our bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash rollofplay, capital R, capital P, um, to reach out, fill out the form, contact us. We would love to hear uh, if you'd be interested in running a game potentially, or uh, if you would like to um, play a game with us. Uh, we will also continue to do roll call uh, every two weeks on Thursday. Uh, next time we'll be uh, on the, we're talking about the open boat. So we'll be having some of the folks who played in that game from a few weeks ago uh, here to talk <laughs> about that experience. Uh, it was a bit, um, a lot, you know. I mean, very. Talk about a gritty talk game. Talk about a gritty that was, game. That was a gritty game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, there was one death that maybe, that's our first mm -hmm. death on um, Roll of Play, I think, right? Um, so I mean, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll debrief from, uh, from that uh, on Roll Call next time. Um, but we 
would love your questions in advance of that. Feel free to put them in the chat on um, BTUL Studios on Twitch or send them via Twitter with the hashtag VTUL Roll Call, and we'll collect those. So that'll be two weeks two weeks from today, right, That's Kayla? correct. More or less. Yep, two weeks from today. Roll Call two weeks from today. Roll Play next Friday, and then two weeks after that. That's right. We're... We're doing lots of things. Uh, there is other programming on this channel as well. Uh, next Wednesday, we will have several offerings uh, because it is Giving Day for Virginia Tech. Uh, giving Day of Virginia Tech runs uh, noon on the 24th to noon on the 25th, I believe. And we'll be having programming um, several times throughout the day of the 24th uh, to share some of the things that we're working on in the libraries and more of the programming that you've been able to find here thus far. Um, to help other folks uh, learn a little bit about what we're doing here and support us if they are so inclined. Uh, and if you are so inclined, you can also do that. Maybe we'll put the link for that in the chat, producer. That's an audible. Uh, <laughs> so maybe you can find... Surprising producers. <laughs> hey, you know what? If you're chat modding, sometimes surprises happen. Yeah, and <laughs> and the link for that, um, the link for that will be shared on the 24th uh, as well. So... Um, that is there is uh in the chat we have that the link doesn't exist yet um so we will be sharing that stay tuned um if you'd be interested <laughs> but with that i think those are all of the announcements that i am uh i am supposed to make um <laughs> does anyone have anything else that they'd like to to share before we sign off Come participate and play. I get to meet people outside of the library and like get to know my colleagues even better. And it's fun to yeah. see what kind of creative decisions we end up making. So uh, it's and, well worth it. Yeah, and as a participant who is not part of the libraries, it was very easy to get involved. I just had to reach out and say, hey, I really want to do this. And they said, yeah, great, come and play. Um, and it's been a really fun, easy experience to just jump in and everyone's been really welcoming. So I highly encourage getting involved. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. We uh, appreciate uh, your time as panelists and our viewers. We really appreciate your time um, and thanks for joining us. If you missed this uh, one shot, and you want to watch it now that you've heard all about why we thought it was a lot of fun. You can watch that on our YouTube channel, uh, which is linked. Spoilers, watch it in backwards. <laughs> yeah, well, I now mean... you've had it spoiled for you. So. <laughs> I mean, no, they it, it would still be dialogue. fun. That's true. That's there true. were a lot of funny uh, um, situations and contexts. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's true. So much more scraps uh, in, uh, in the playthrough. <laughs> so now with 200% more scraps. <laughs> more scraps. More scraps. <laughs> For sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, so enjoy that and um, reach out if you want to uh, support the channel, if you have suggestions, if you want to play with us. Uh, we are going to raid uh, North Carolina um, University Libraries, right? North Carolina State uh, Libraries. Yep. They're uh, doing stuff over on their Twitch channel. I don't know what it is, but I bet it's fun. So we're going <laughs> to raid them uh and we hope that you will enjoy whatever content they've got going on we don't love it yeah <laughs> i, I didn't have a confirmation